Unhappy is he to whom the memories of childhood bring only fear and sadness. Generally speaking, I would say that I had a fairly happy childhood, but a few key negative events stand out in my mind that I think had a huge impact on me as an individual and have shaped the way I am today. Although my recollections are probably not perfect, the resulting feelings are real. There's a total of six key events which I will discuss today in chronological order. So let's begin. 1. Mickey Monkey and the Gas Chamber when I was about four or five, perhaps younger, I had some undisclosed medical condition which I won't go into here, but it required surgery. I was told by my parents that I had to go see the doctor to make everything better. On the drive over, I knew something was not quite right, as they were acting a little bit different from normal. We arrived at the hospital and I was put into a small white treatment room, stinking of disinfectant. I remember sitting on the examination table with a small simian friend by my side a soft toy which I called Mickey Monkey. My parents were outside talking to the doctors, so I immediately knew something was wrong. If everything was okay, then surely they would be talking in front of me. Eventually, a doctor entered with a gas mask in hand. He tried to explain to me that I needed to put on the mask so that I could go to sleep, but I wasn't having any of it. I think I screamed and cried, and the doctor knew that I wasn't going to give in that easily. As a final act of persuasion, the doctor placed the mask over me. Mickey Monkey's face and sent him to sleep in his arms. My only thought was that Mickey Monkey was now dead, and that if I didn't fight, I would suffer the same fate. Eventually, overpowered by a number of hospital staff, I was gassed, and that was the last memory I have of that incident. Many years later, I remember smelling Mickey Monkey and still being able to smell that noxious, nauseating gas. It just didn't seem to wash out. Perhaps it was all in my imagination, or I had associated the smell of the monkey with the smell of the gas chamber. Either way, I have never forgotten that moment. They may as well have been trying to kill me, because that's what it certainly felt like. To this day, I'm hesitant around doctors. I tend to question them a lot, especially when it comes to matters of anesthesia. As an example, a few years ago, a dentist recommended that it would be easiest to work on my two-year-old son's teeth if he was put under a so-called GA, a general anesthetic. But I wasn't buying it. I had heard a lot about dentists profiteering from these sorts of treatments and really couldn't see the need, not to mention the possible risks of GA on the developing brain. I politely refused and said I needed to seek out a second opinion. The next dentist also recommended a GA, so I sought out a third and then a fourth opinion. Finally, I came upon a dentist who had young children himself and recommended against general anesthesia. He said that my son's cavities weren't weren't that bad and that we could simply monitor them over the next year or so until he was ready to sit in the dentist's chair. It worked out well, and now my son's teeth are fine. There was absolutely no need for him to undergo general anesthesia with all its associated risks, but yet so many dentists tried to convince me otherwise. 2. The Wife of Satan at the age of about nine, I'd moved to a new school, the fourth school in as many years. It was a Christian school, as my mum was now Christian, and apparently public school wasn't cutting it. I remember the teacher well. He was a kind man and treated me well. But one day, he was sick, and the substitute teacher happened to be the wife of the then pastor. I knew of her, but had never previously interacted with her. On that one fateful day, I remember her asking a question to the class. Who is the Governor General of Australia? I had no idea, so I hid my eyes from her menacing gaze. Of course, she chose me to answer the question, despite other children having raised their hands. I simply told her I didn't know. She then replied, You don't know who the Governor General of Australia is? And then she made me stand up. She continued to berate me. You are Australian, right? Then surely you should know who the Governor General is. This went on for what felt like an eternity. I started to go red in the face from embarrassment, but she continued. I can't understand how a nine-year-old boy doesn't know who the Governor-General of Australia is. It beggars belief. 
Finally, I started crying, which obviously is what she wanted all along. She made me sit down, and I remember trembling in my chair, all the children around me staring at me. From that day, I had fantasies of her falling into a pit, or being bitten by a poisonous snake. But it never happened. As far as I know, she's still alive, hopefully frail enough so that she can't hurt anybody ever again. Of course, I've had extreme anxiety ever since whenever I've been in a classroom environment, fearful that I won't know the answer to one of the teacher's arbitrary questions and be stood up and openly mocked in front of my peers. 3. The Wailing Witch as a child, I remember enjoying singing and making music. I would make recordings with my friends on my dad's stereo and play them back. I remember laughing and having a great time. But then at the same Christian school, the music teacher decided to destroy any semblance of interest I had in music. The school had a seniors choir for all children in grades 5, 6 and 7. However, we all had to attend an individual trial just to make sure that we were suitable. It came to my turn and I stood in front of the piano as the music teacher played the tune to Jingle Bells. I confidently sang along, thinking I was doing really well. But then all of a sudden, she stopped playing and said something along the lines of, No, 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 that was awful. Just awful. You obviously can't sing, so I won't be inviting you to sing in the school choir. I think only me and three other kids in the school weren't invited. There was the obese kid, the nerdy kid with coke bottle glasses, a smelly kid who wore dirty clothes, and then of course, me. We were assigned to a room during choir practice where we had to build Lego. Every year, we'd do the same stupid trial, and every year I'd be assigned to the Lego room. I honestly felt like a real failure. No doubt it had untold effects on my mental health. I remember having fantasies of the music teacher drinking hot tea and burning out her voice box, or her leaning over too closely to the sewing machine and stitching up her mouth. But it never happened. As far as I know, she's still alive, hopefully frail enough so that she can't hurt anybody else ever again. Of course, from that day, I've had extreme anxiety whenever I've needed to sing. I've tried to overcome it, but still have feelings of dread whenever a microphone is put in front of me. Luckily, I've had none of these feelings when singing to my children. They don't seem to judge me like that music teacher did. You know, the one that was supposed to be teaching me music. 4. The Devil's Cane One day, at the same Christian school, I remember it being unseasonably hot. I was at the bubbler getting a drink when somebody next to me started squirting me with water. I squirted him back and we spent the next 30 seconds or so having a bit of a water fight. It was a lot of fun, especially on a hot summer's day. But then some prissy little girls decided to go tell a teacher about our little water fight, and as a result, I was sent to the headmaster's office. The headmaster told me that the girls had told him that I had squirted them. I said, No, I wet the boy next to me after he had wet me. The girls weren't even near me. The headmaster stood up and said that he didn't believe me. He reached over behind his desk and pulled out a long box. Inside the box was a weaponized cane. He pulled it out and said that obviously I was lying and that the punishment for lying is three strikes of the cane. I started screaming and crying and telling him that I didn't even wet the girls. Fortunately for me, he put the cane away, but promised that if I was ever sent to his office again, the outcome would be a very different one. I ran out crying, angry at the injustice. I remember having fantasies of him being publicly flogged with his backside exposed in front of the entire school, but it never happened. As far as I know, he's still alive, hopefully frail enough so that he can't hurt anybody ever again. Of course, from that day, I've had extreme anxiety whenever I've needed to deal with people in positions of authority. Actually, only a few years ago, when I was in my early 30s, I was riding to uni when a police officer stopped me for not dismounting when I was crossing a pedestrian crossing, even though there was absolutely nobody else on the crossing and no cars to be seen. He gave me a lecture about the reasons we need to dismount and a stern warning telling me that if ever I get caught doing it again, there'll be consequences to pay. I remember riding off crying. I mean, a man in my 30s, because a police officer got angry at me. The tears came from nowhere. Again, I just felt complete injustice. Actually, that law no longer exists in Queensland. You can now legally ride across a zebra crossing, as long as you do so in a safe manner. It just goes to show you how arbitrary these laws really are. 5. The Apathetic Assistant 
Again, at the same Christian school, I know there seems to be a pattern occurring here, it was sports trials. I was in line for the long jump, and one of the boys behind me decided that I'd be a good target for one of his newly learnt karate kicks. He kicked me straight in the kidneys, and I fell to the floor. I got up crying and walked straight up to the assistant teacher who was taking all the long jump measurements. I told him what just happened, but his first response was, "'Look, I'm busy. Just tell him not to do it again.' I remember walking back still whimpering. As I got back in line, the boy told me that because I had dobbed, he'd have to kick me again. But this time, I was ready. I put my hands up in front of my face and body to protect myself, so he kicked me three times in quick succession in the side of the legs. It hurt like hell, and I started bawling. I hobbled up to the assistant teacher with everybody staring at me as I walked by, but he showed no remorse. He just yelled at me. I told you before, I'm busy. Get back in line. The boy who kicked me laughed, but luckily for me, he didn't kick me again. I guess he thought he had dispensed enough hurt that day. I knew the boy liked BMXs, so I remember having fantasies of him losing his legs in a bicycle accident, but it never happened. As far as I know, he became a security guard. I saw him one time a few years ago at a multi-story car park where he was manning the front gate. He seemed friendly enough towards me, and honestly, I don't hold any grudges against him. Kids do stupid things. The assistant teacher, on the other hand, should have known better. He should have stepped in and done something. Instead, he was too concerned about getting his precious long jump measurements. As far as I know, he's still alive, probably still an active teacher. Hopefully he's learnt to, you know, look after children. 6. The Merciless Mother one day at home, I was probably 10 or 11, I thought it would be interesting to try to flush a plastic bag down the toilet. Unsurprisingly, it got stuck, and the toilet bowl started to fill up. I ran for the hills, hoping that no one would notice. Suddenly, I heard a scream from my mother. Who put a plastic bag in the toilet? She screamed out my name, and I had no choice but to come. In her hands, she had the infamous dog leash, the one that she would use to punish us with. We hadn't owned a dog for a number of years, but yet she hung onto it. I was scared. I didn't want to be hit. So when she asked me who put the plastic bag down the toilet, I swore that it wasn't me. She wanted to know who did it, so I gave her a name. The name of my intellectually and physically impaired older brother. She immediately went to his room and thrashed him. I remember his cries for help and the extreme feelings of guilt that I had afterwards. I've since spoken to my mother about this, and she has apologised a number of times for the ongoing physical abuse. But to be fair to her, it was much more common back then. Most families I knew believed in smacking their children. Actually, it was odd for a family not to physically punish their children. I remember the lady next door punishing her grandchildren with an actual whip. She would stand them out in front of the whole family and publicly whip them. In my family, unfortunately for my brother, he copped the brunt of the abuse, even when he wasn't responsible. Yes, I feel bad, but I was put in a situation as a young child where I was threatened with physical violence. That's not a good place to be in as a kid. The only thing I could think of doing to escape the violence was to blame my disabled brother, knowing full well that he couldn't articulate his innocence. It was a horrible situation to be put in, and it has affected me throughout my life. As an aside, I had suffered years of teasing and torment for having a brother who had such an obvious disability, but luckily, by the age of 16 or 17, I learnt to deal with it and defended my brother at all costs. I don't bear any grudges against my mother, as she has apologised a number of times for the torment. I'm not going to live a life where I don't forgive people. I suppose she was going through some tough times herself. Not that that's an excuse, but it does explain a lot. Despite the history, I now regularly see my mother, and she enjoys spending time with my children. She also happens to watch this channel fairly regularly, so hi mum. No hard feelings. One good thing that has come out of all of this is that I don't smack my own children or threaten them with violence of any kind. My son is the first to speak up whenever there's an injustice, or even a perceived injustice, and that's good. That's exactly what I want him to do. I don't want him to fall victim to some sociopath teacher at school. These events have changed me, whether that be for good or bad. To some extent, they explain why I am the way I am today. I'm not very social. I'm not very good with people. I have an innate distrust of those in authority, and find it very hard to get on well with managers and team leaders and all the rest of them. It's probably the reason why I hate full-time work so much. 
However, as a positive consequence of these experiences, I stand up against injustice whenever it arises, as I've suffered a lot of it myself. I'll be the first to step in when I see someone being treated unfairly. If that's all that I've gotten out of all of this, well, I think that's probably a good thing. Thanks for listening. Mm -hmm.